Um, so, Um, just to start, um, I always want to clarify um, with some terminology um, about what is a pesticide. Um, some, sometimes people think um, insecticides are, you know, just uh, pesticides equal just insecticides, but really it's this umbrella term um, that includes anything that you would like to get rid of. So we have insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, rodenticides. There's a whole host of different types of pesticides, and insecticides are just one group of those. And Today, I am going to focus on insecticides. So a little bit about changing pesticide use. Um, it's, it's constant. Um, there are always uh, new compounds um, being introduced um, onto the market. Um, there can also uh, be changing pest types or pressures um, that would cause um, someone to want to use a different type of pesticide. Or perhaps um, there is resistance to current pesticides being applied, so um, another one might be useful in that situation. Um, other things that might change um, which pesticides are being applied in an area could be restrictions. Um, there could be concerns on previously used compounds, and those could then have um, limits um, on where they're applied or sometimes even an outright ban. Um, there can also be changes in crop types. Um, so this can really change um, what types of pesticides could be used. Um, one of the examples I, I use um, is that in California, there used to be quite a bit of cotton. Um, but as um, there was more of a demand for almonds, especially in emerging markets in Asia, um, farmers started um, converting their cotton fields to almonds. And as you, as you can imagine, this just changes the whole type of crop being grown, which will also change um, what types of pesticides are applied, when they're applied, et cetera. Um, there's other examples of that. Or you can take a different type of example um, as ethanol prices uh, went up and it was more profitable to grow corn there were certain areas that were more margins that they actually started growing in corn. So it wasn't a crop change as much as just more of, say, a particular crop. Um, and then more recently, we've seen a change in application techniques. So we, um, people, people typically think of pesticide um, applications as granulars or sprays. Um, but one of the things I want to focus on today is um, this more you know, prevalence of seed coatings. And I'm going to talk about why um, seed coatings have been increasing in use. Um, so as I said, today I'm going to focus on insecticides. Um, I just kind of want to give a timeline. I'm going to come back to this timeline a bit. Um, just how, you know, this is a, a generalization sort of as um, insecticide use has changed over the years. Um, if you want to think of sort of the, the poster child for you know, synthetic pesticides is probably DDT um, that came about sort of in a post-World War II industrial era. And of course, later on, we discovered it had problems. It got banned. Um, if we want to go to more of the uh, recent past, um, if you want to look at in the 90s, um, the organophosphates, such as chlorpyrifos and diazinon, were widely used. Um, but as there were concerns over them, especially um, to mammals and in aquatic systems, there was a shift to the pyrethroid insecticides. So a couple examples of those are bisphenthrin and permethrin. Um, but then not, uh, not only were there concerns about potential pyrethroid issues, but um, the neonicotinoids um, really kind of came onto the market, um, and they could be used in a different application method. And so those are some of the more recent insecticides um, that have started being used. Um, now, there's a chance you've heard about neonicotinoids. Um, a lot of the reason they've been in the news is um, when they started to be used more prevalently, um, they were implicated in uh, the colony collapse disorder of honeybees. Um, I'm not going to talk about the honeybee issues. Um, it's a very complex matter. There's um, uh, many factors um, that could be contributing to it. Um, but this is really how um, neonicotinoids came on the radar and really started um, coming into the uh, you know, popular media. Um, they could also have risk to other pollinators and that sort of thing. So you know, if you've heard about them, this is probably one of um, the major reasons why. But why are the neonicotinoids so popular? Um, you know, why is this their sudden um, increase in use and, and just different types of use? Um, so currently, um, as a class, they are the most widely used insecticides in the world. Um, they have home uses, um, so um, they're included in pet flea treatments. Um, you can find them in lawn and garden applications. Um, they have a bunch of agricultural uses, um, granular foliar sprays, and seed treatments. 
So they have a wide um, variety of not just ag uses, but also those found in urban areas. Um, structurally, they're similar to nicotine, which is how they get their name, uh, the neonicotinoids. And these are neurotoxins to insects. Um, one of, another reason for their popularity is they're active against a broad spectrum of insects. So you can you know, use them for many different pest pressures. Um, and one of the reasons why the neonics were um, first you know, thought of as a good alternative is that they are less toxic to vertebrates, such as man mammals versus other things um, that have been used in the past, such as those organophosphates or pyrifos and diazinon. Um, so coming back to this kind of merging of neonicotinoids, which are a new class, um, or a newer class of insecticides, and this whole um, seed coating, seed treatment thing. Um, so neonicotinoids are sort of unique in that they're what they call systemic pesticides, which means they can actually be taken up by the plant. Um, they're highly water soluble. And so that means they can actually um, be taken up through the water, in, through the plant roots, um, up into the leaves the pollen, the flowers. Um, and so by having any seed you might want to plant coated um, with these pesticides, this is what they kind of look at as a target ap application, um, something that you know is touted as precision agriculture. So instead of having to spray a broad area like a, like a cornfield um, with a pesticide where you can get drift and overspray and those sorts of things, now you have a targeted application where it's only on the seed. Um, so in a brown 2000, um, clothine and thymethoxam enter the markets. Um, Imidacloprid had been used before then. But anyway, this is about the time that seed treatments really become more common. And I'm not, it's, we'll look in pounds, but um, it's increased had use greatly. And um, a lot of this was from seed coatings. So at this point um, in the US, nearly all of corn and about a third of soybeans um, Plant today use a neonicotinoid. I will also note that in these seed coatings, it's not just the neonicotinoid. They can also include um, one to five fungicides. So you're getting more than just uh, one type of pesticide on these seed treatments. Um, to talk a little bit more about the environmental fate of the neonicotinoids, and on there is a is a cartoon of how you know um, the neonics can be transported into the environment. As I said, these are highly water-soluble compounds. And as you can see in the diagram, you know, they show that um, they can be taken up by plants um, into the leaves and, and flowers and pollen. Um, and that's where a lot of the uh, pollinator concerns come from, are you know, um, bees and, and other uh, pollinators landing on these uh, plants um, and maybe becoming exposed to these neonicotinoids through the pollen. Um, but you know, because these compounds are water soluble, um, they're able to be mobile. They also can persist um, for enough time that they can be transported off site. So um, they've estimated um, about 10% um, is taken up by the plant. These seed coatings, I've seen numbers anywhere from 2 to 20%. So if you think of that other mass um, of the neonicotinoid that's on the seed coating that's not taken up by the plant, um, it can be in the soil, and because these are water-soluble compounds, if you get any irrigation or rain event, you can start getting them transported um, from the application area through the water, um, either to nearby streams or to groundwater, and then they can get out into the greater environment. And this is what I'm really interested in, this sort of aquatic um, water exposure. I would want to take a step back again to our, our timeline that I brought up earlier. Um, and, you know, not only are we dealing with this changing pesticide use, um, just from new compounds and, and trying to keep up with those and maybe having to come up with new analytical techniques to measure them, we also are seeing a change um, in the environmental state. And that's really going to drive where we should be looking for these compounds, um, where they might go in the environment. So if you want to go back to the organophosphates, um, they actually tended to partition in both the water and the sediment. Um, so you could find them in both uh, matrices. Whereas when there was a change to the pyrethroids, these are highly hydrophobic compounds. And so they tended to bind to sediments and soils. Uh, they would move off-site uh, more associated with these. And so there was a, more of a concern um, with toxicity to benthic organisms and such. Now, as we've shifted um, to the neonicotinoids, as I said, they're highly water-soluble. So now you've changed again. and so. 
um, instead of like the pyrethroids where you had a, a potential sediment issue, um, you get these neonicotinoids that are going to be more dissolved. Um, they're going to have a greater chance to move off-site through the water, and also they're going to um, be exposing uh, organisms that actually live in the water column more than those that are in the benthos. So just once again to look at kind of neonicotinoid use in the U.S. Um, and how it's been changing. Um, once again, I'm showing on the right um, usage um, for three of the most commonly used neonics, and these are the ones I'm going to talk about um, mostly um, for the rest, um, or I'm going to highlight in the rest of the slides. So you have imidacloprid, um, the neonic that's been used the longest. It's got a variety of, of uses, as you can see um, recently. Um, with seed coatings, a lot of it is on soybeans. And then you have clothianidin, which is almost used exclusively on corn, um, seed coatings for corn, um, although there are some other uses and more and more are coming onto the market. And then you have thiamethoxam, which is used on corn and soy and, uh, and other pesticides. Not, and, and while a lot of these are driven by seed coatings, as I said, they can be done as granular, um, applications, foliar sprays, um, drenches, um, they do have a variety of uses. Um, if you want to look at you know, the areas in the U.S. where neonic use is the highest, um, because these are so widely used um, on corn and soy, you can see that the Midwest is kind of the hot spot um, for their use. Um, but you do have other areas um, where they're also used. Um, and imidacloprid, which is, has the most variety of uses, is used in quite a few places um, around the U.S. So as I said, I'm, I'm really interested in this sort of uh, aquatic transport, this water transport of these insecticides um, from where they're applied. Uh, and you know, how, what concentrations will we be seeing in the water? Are we seeing them? You know, how far are they moving um, from the site of application? Um, initially, uh, you know, the, the first kind of thought was that, you know, well, they may not be taken up all by the plant, but you know it's this precision agriculture, it's these seed coatings. So you know, would we actually be finding them in our uh, streams and waterways? So in 2013, um, we kind of did one of our first studies, um, and we targeted Iowa. As you can see, um, it's kind of the ground zero for uh, high in neonicotinoid use um, because of the amount of corn and soy grown in the area. Um, and we did detect neonicotinoids um, frequently in this area. And if you can see the figure on the bottom right kind of shows, um, it shows samples we collected at, I think, nine stream locations um, throughout the growing season. Um, and you can look at frequencies and concentrations. But I would like to highlight that the highest concentrations and most frequent detections happen during planting. So before planting, we did get some detections, but concentrations were relatively low. We got this, this bigger pulse um, during planting. And then that tended to tail off as we went throughout the growing season. So what that was indicating to us is that um, these are likely coming from, you know, if they're coming during the planting season, those are from uh, seed coatings. Um, which, so this was sort of the first study to document that there's the potential of these seed coatings to create a pulse of insecticides in waterways near areas of application. Um, I would also like to highlight um, a pole seen in the spring near the time of planting is not unheard of for things like herbicides. Um, if you're familiar with atrazine, it's a lot of times it's seen as this sort of pulse because it's applied as a pre-emergent herbicide. And then as you get any irrigation or rain events, um, you can see it run off and you get this peak in spring and then it tails off. Um, however, this has not been seen um, before with insecticides. Um, typically in um, insecticide monitoring, uh, uh, detections were rather infrequent or sporadic and tended to happen later in summer. But now, um, with this um, you know, change in use, we're getting this, this spring pulse that we had previously seen uh, with herbicides. Um, so this is just kind of taking one of our sites and giving a more fine detail from this 2013 Iowa study. And as I said, it, it just shows you more about this, um, what we call this spring flush phenomena. So that grayed out area is um, sort of you know the the planting season, and as you can see, um, not only do you need the the seeds to be planted, but you also need a pulse of water. So that's shown by that those blue discharge lines. So um, whenever we were getting a storm event, 
and we were able to go out and take a sample, um, we are actually seeing increased concentrations, which is just reiterating, you know, not only do you need these uh, compounds to be in the area, but you need rain because they're highly water soluble to start moving them. Um, so our Iowa study um, documented this occurrence of neonicotinoids, um, but we wanted to get kind of a greater um, spatial analysis of, of which neonicotinoids we might be uh, detecting um, across the country. Um, so this was a nationwide study. It was part of a, a much larger study looking at other compounds, um, but I'm just going to focus on the neonicotinoids here. Um, we uh, looked at 38 streams um, in a variety of states. You can see them on the map. Um, and this was a one-time sampling event at each of these sites, so we don't have the uh, temporal variability that we do at those sites we had in Iowa, but this is going to give us a better geographic distribution. Um, I will say um, one or more neonicotinoid was detected in over half of our samples, um, and then a quarter of them had two or more, and we had up to five neonicotinoids um, detected in one sample. I will note that we measure six. Um, those are kind of the six that are uh, registered and most frequently used um, in the U.S. Um, looking at concentrations, um, on the bottom right, you can see um, they were all on the scale. So we're talking hundreds of nanograms uh, per liter maximum concentrations for these, and, and you do get some variability. But even nationwide, um, we detected um, three imidacloprid, clofenin, and thymethoxam um, were the most frequent detected, which were the three that were also frequently detected um, in our Iowa study. We have uh, less frequent hits of two other ones, dinotafuran and acetamiprid. Um, those have, uh, are, tend to be used um, not for seed coatings. They have different uses. Some are urban sprays and, and that sort of thing. Um, so we tend to detect them less frequently. We also um, did some relationships with land cover um, at the sites we measured, and we found that both clothianidin and thiamethoxam had positive correlations with the amount of row crops um, in the in the area, um, in the watershed around where the sample was collected, which is not um, which is not unexpected considering these are commonly used um, as seed coatings, especially in corn and soy. So a positive correlation with row crops is expected. Um, with imidacloprid, we got a positive correlation with the amount of urbanization in the area. And as I said, imidacloprid has a wide variety of uses, but it is also um, frequently used in urban areas. Um, to look at the, uh, the uh, distribution um, from our nationwide study um, on a site-by-site -site basis, I, I don't have the sites um, listed by their actual site. They're just given a number. Um, but what I wanted to point he out here is that you know concentrations at a given site um, do vary. And you can see those ones um, where they're the sites where we have multiple um, neonicotinoids that we measured. Um, I do like to point out the one site um, the one site we had five neonicotinoids measured. That was also um, the maximum total neonicotinoid concentration that we had measured um, at this point. Um, and at this point, I do like to note that a lot of these studies we were doing were in you know, streams and rivers and not edge of ag field. Um, so people that have done studies like right at the edge of an ag field have found higher concentrations. Um, but the hundreds of nanograms per liter is more typical of what we're finding in some of our larger waterways. And so, yeah, so we had one site um, that was in, um, central, off the central coast of California um, that had five neonics detected. Um, if you're at all familiar with this area, um, it's, it's got a lot of diverse agriculture. You've got strawberries and Brussels sprouts and raspberries and artichokes and all sorts of, you know, non-corn and soy uh, uh, agriculture, so that um, so with this variety of agriculture usually comes a wider variety of pesticides used. Um, now, just looking at an overall detection frequency um, basis, we've done a, a, a you know a bunch of other studies um, where we've looked at a lot of pesticides and neonics were included, or um, we did some more neonic focused studies other than the two. Um, I'm highlighting in this talk, but what I did was aggregate all the water samples um, that we sort of collected to date, um, and we had about 216 ag samples and about 160 urban samples. And just looking at um, detection frequency, you can get these 
trends that I had noted from our nationwide study. Um, this just gives more data points to support them. Imidacloprid is the most frequently detected neonicotinoid in all our water samples. Um, and it's detected quite frequently over, in over 80% of urban areas. Um, but it is also um, detected in about 40% of agricultural areas. Clothine and thymethoxam, those that are widely used on seed coatings in corn and soy, are more frequently detected um, in the agricultural areas. And dinotafuran and acetamiprid, I said those um, that aren't used as seed coatings, just less use overall, so we have um, lower detections. Um, somewhat more for dinotafuran in urban areas. They've been spraying them on trees for certain um, pest uh, issues in different areas of the country, but we'll also see them in some agricultural areas. Um, once again, we're going to go back to our timeline. So we've talked about changing pesticide use, how this changes the environmental fate, and of course this can also change the toxicity and what organisms might be affected by these pesticides. Um, so at this, um, now there's, uh, I'm going to talk about more organisms um, in the next couple of slides, but here I want to just focus on these are kind of some of the, the test species that are done in lab toxicity tests. So when looking at the organophosphates, um, seriodaphnia was sort of the um, most, uh, or the daphnia were the most sensitive um, to organophosphates. Whereas when you switch to pyrethroids, you said they're a hydrophobic benthic organism, you have hyalol azteca, um, and that was the most sensitive organism. Shifting over to the neonicotinoids, um, things such as hyalol are actually quite, um, you know, it takes much larger uh, uh, concentrations of neonicotinoids to get any sort of effect. Um, they, they don't really have it, but um, the picture I'm showing there is of uh, Acronymus dilutus midge, um, which is sort of a different spe test species, and those are very susceptible, um, you know, at lower concentrations to neonicotinoids. So we also have to consider that when we're trying to look at, you know, um, not only where are we finding these compounds, but what might the potential effects be. Um, if you're only ever using one test species um, for your, say, toxicity, toxicity lab tests, um, as this pesticide use changes, you might not um, be getting the full picture. So here I've taken all the concentrations that we've measured in all our samples, um, and I just wanted to plot them against kind of the so what versus some of these toxicity levels. Um, now, the first ones I'd like to discuss are the US EPA aquatic life benchmarks, um, the ones that are currently out. So um, you'll see at the, the sort of top of the figures, and I have these separated by ag and urban areas, um, the EPA acute toxicity level for any of these compounds is above um, the, the figure here. So, so none of the concentrations um, that we've measured in any of our studies would be above that current um, EPA acute toxicity level. If you drop it down to the EPA chronic toxicity level, we've had a few samples in agricultural areas exceed this, um, this, this aquatic life benchmark. Now, um, there's been a host of other literature that indicates that maybe these US EPA aquatic life benchmarks are not sensitive enough. Um, I talked about some of the, the species that might be more sensitive, and part of it is that in some of these standardized EPA test species, um, some of these are, are the least, um, they're least sensitive to the neonicotinoids. But that doesn't mean in an actual aquatic system that other species may not be affected by these. So I just wanted to note um, there was sort of a metadata analysis done by Christy Morrissey that was published in 2015. And there's some other studies but um, that have all kind of come out with similar chronic and acute toxicity levels. So if you want to you know, use those from the Morrissey paper, um, if you look at acute toxicity in ag areas, and you know, one urban sample were actually um, exceeding uh, what they might suggest um, as an acute toxicity level. Um, I will note they vary slightly from neonic to neonic, um, but I'm just trying to use this for illustrative purposes. Um, and for the chronic toxicity level, you know, we're starting to get many more samples in both ag and urban areas that could be, you know, a potential concern um, in these aquatic environments. Um, I would also like to note that the EPA um, did release, um, they sort of did a, a, in 
this year in January they did a preliminary risk assessment for imidacloprid, so it was trying to update some of those numbers. Um, and in their preliminary risk assessment, they did come up with a, a lower acute and chronic level um, that had been that had they're lower than their previous aquatic life benchmarks, um, and they're more in um, the range of some of these other studies. Um, On this not, boat, the age of 309, the nays are one eight. So it'll be interesting to see um, once that once that's actually finished. Um, I will note that imidacloprid is typically considered the most toxic um, neonic. Um, to, to most of these aquatic species. But this just kind of puts all the um, concentrations that we've measured into some sort of toxicity con context because, you know, a lot of times with improved analytical methods and instrumentation, um, just because we can measure something doesn't necessarily mean um, it can be an issue. Um, but um, as more data comes out on these compounds and um, there's kind of more of a consensus on chronic and acute toxicity levels, um, we're starting to see areas that, that might be of potential concern. So to kind of, you know, look at this whole neonics um, in sort of our, our U.S. waterways, you know, we know they dissolve in water. We know they can move away um, from the application area. Um, we know that there are levels that potentially affect aquatic insects. Um, things like mayflies and caddisflies are very sensitive um, to these insecticides. Um, and that can also have an indirect effect. You know, if these insect populations are low, um, that could potentially affect um, things such as birds. And so I want to go more into that whole direct versus indirect effect and, and how, we, how we look at those. So if you want to take birds as sort of an example, if you think of neonics um, being directly toxic um, to birds, um, so based on sort of our pesticide use, um, the acute toxicity of neonics in birds is lower than the pesticides um, that were replaced. Of course, this varies by species. Um, but then again, if you look at this treated seed aspect, um, there have been studies that have noted that you know one treated seed um, could potentially poison a bird. Um, or that even one-tenth of this treated seed um, can have a, a reproductive effect. So this would sort of be, um, you know, a bird eats a neonic treated seed and that would be your direct effect. And while this can happen, although there's, there's some um, uh, research done that, you know, if, if birds are on fields, if they have another option, they tend to avoid these coated seeds. You might have seen in the previous picture that they're colored to let people know, and that might be why some of the birds um, potentially could stay away, but they do have, um, you know, they could directly eat th these seeds. Um, sort of a, a bigger question that has come up is, are these indirect effects? Um, you know, these neonicotinoids enter aquatic systems. They could be toxic to, you know, as I said, mayflies, caddisflies, midges. Um, and then that could decrease the insect population. And a lot of, you know, there are insectivorous birds. And so this could really um, have an indirect effect on them, but indirect effects are, you know, a little bit harder to determine than these direct effects. You have, um, you know, multiple factors going on, um, and it becomes more complicated. So this is what I always like to call my, let's look at cute animals, take a break. <laughs> but one of the major concerns we have with the neonics is, are they affecting these aquatic insects? Now, I always talk about on just trying to get attention and to get people to who care about this potential issue, especially the greater public. Um, if you can always relate this to what I call charismatic megafauna, something you know, cute and fuzzy and maybe preferably mammalian, you know, people get really interested. Um, that's not you know, what, this, what these neonics, you know, a lot of their potential concerns are. Then I always talk about you know, species people care about. It may not be as soft and fuzzy, um, but they have big implications. Um, you know, waterfowl hunters are really into what's going on with ducks. Um, you know, salmon, birds, butterflies, you know, things that people think are pretty or that um, have a, a large industry behind them. Um, and then there's the, what I call the less charismatic thing. So, you know, are they small fish like a delta smelt or an amphibian or just insects? You know, people, a lot of people are like, why, why do I care um, that there's, you know, potentially less insects? So you have to really, you know, drive home that it has these, these ripple effects, especially for things like, like ducks. You know, a lot of um, waterfowl hunters are very concerned if you're going to tell them that their, you know, mayfly and caddisfly population is going down because that's what their ducks are eating. 
also it's just sometimes setting the context. And so as there's more people um, trying to look at these indirect effects, especially as it relates to neonics, insects, and birds, um, there was one study that correlated um, imidacloprid concentrations in surface waters with reduced bird populations. Um, it was six, in 16 of the 15 bird species um, they looked at, so not all birds. Um, I was part of a group that tried to just look at, um, we correlated neonicotinoid use with decreasing populations in butterflies, um, and we found it to be more severe for some of the smaller butterflies. Um, we did look at other, you know, changes in other pesticide use classes, um, such as the pyrethroids, and um, didn't get any correlation. But I'll note one of these things is, you know, just because we're getting a correlation does not um, actually give us a causation. Um, what would be really great, you know, is if we had more surveys of, you know, what insect populations were for some of these birds that eat them, and what we don't have is that. But, you know, people are trying to work more on these um, effects and really get at the heart of them to figure out where neonicotinoids fit into this equation. Um, just to give an update um, on neonicotinoid use overall, um, so we come back to this, you know, precision agriculture and these coating of seeds and, you know, using, um, if you do the calculations, having a seed coating will give you um, less active ingredient in a certain area than a broad, than the, like, say, a spray application. However, now they're getting near 100% usage, say, on corn. And so you're actually getting a more total um, application of these neonics than you were. So when you coat them on the seed, you know, you're planting them, um, they're already there. Um, versus in the past where there may have been only application when it was, when it was deemed necessary um, because of a, a pest pressure. Um, the EPA did a study um, where they found soybean-treated fields did not have an increased use um, from this, this prophylactic application. Um, however, you know, there are um, other studies, and um, this also seems to be variable by crops. So maybe with soybeans, we weren't getting... Um, any increased yield with these seed coatings. Um, but in England, they found um, with oilseed rape that seed treatments led to less foliar applications. Um, but then in sunflowers, they saw no increase. And so it, it's one of these things that could vary um, by crop. So this may not just be a blanket statement um, about seed coatings overall. And it could be highly variable um, with crop, especially if you have crops that you know, there are some that if you go in there and notice a pest, you can then go back and apply um, what, pet, what insecticide you think is necessary um, versus others is by the time you see, um, say, a certain insect, your crop's done. Um, it's too late to do any sort of um, application. Um, so the neonics are being phased out of wildlife refuges. Um, as I alluded to earlier, the EPA is currently reviewing the neonics um, and their uh, risk assessments. Um, the EU um, did a moratorium on the agricultural use of neonics, and they're still looking um, kind of at that, um, the data and, and what came out of that. Um, in Canada, they're trying to cut the, in Ontario, they're trying to cut the use of neonics um, over the next three years. Um, Maryland sort of banned the consumer use of neonics, so you can see there's, there's different restrictions. Certain areas are doing it. Um, sort of on a consumer use basis, certain areas are doing it on an ag basis, and this is constantly changing, and I don't think this is a complete list, but this is just to kind of give you an idea of sort of, you know, where people are at with um, this whole issue of neonics and um, seed coatings. Um, just wanted to note some of the other projects that we've worked on. Um, I had a project um, with folks at Iowa State University where we looked at buffer strips um, and their potential uh, to reduce neonics. Um, um, they were planted near ag fields. Um, that these were fields that had a historical use of uh, neonicotinoid coated seeds, and we were actually getting some some good results. And it was limiting the uh, transport in groundwater and soil, and we were not detecting. Um, the neonics in the plants. So that's always a question of when you plant something like a buffer strip next to an ag field um, for these highly water-soluble compounds. Um, you know, you might be limiting the off-field transport, but all you also, you know, with these plants that you hope maybe are good for pollinators and such, you also don't want to create an area that they're coming to that's also 
um, has pesticides in it. But um, for our smaller study, we weren't finding that. Um, I partnered with some people at the University of Iowa recently. Um, we did detect neonics in drinking water and tap water. Um, we had low levels, and this should not be surprising um, in this area given the high ag use um, and you know how much we're finding in, in the surface waters in this area. Um, one of the positive things we found out about this is that um, in, in the treatment and some bench scale studies that granular activated carbon is good at removing these compounds. And in a lot of these areas, especially that have atrazine concerns, um, they do use granular sort of an activated carbon. And it's also good to know that um, you know, what can be used for atrazine could also be a, a potentially useful for the removal of neonicotinoids. Um, we're trying to summarize. We did some more occurrence work in the Great Lakes tributaries, um, obviously areas in uh, high ag use, but also uh, sensitive ecosystems. So we're trying to finish up that. And while this was a more water-focused talk, um, I have done work um, with native bees, not honeybees, and we're still trying to continue that um, and how uh, neonicotinoids might affect not just honeybees, but also um, the whole host of other bees um, that might be in um, sort of this landscape um, and how they might be affected by them. So just to, just to summarize, um, you know, we frequently detect neonics in streams across the U.S. Um, at this point, you know, we do find areas without any detections, but, um, you know, be it urban or ag, um, we are detecting them. Um, depending on which um, levels, you know, you want to use for your acute and chronic toxicity, they, these levels are being exceeded, um, and they're most likely having an effect on aquatic invertebrates. Um, the transport of these neonics to streams is driven by use and precipitation. Um, so especially with these seed coatings, um, you know, not only do they have to be used, you have to have um, then a, a hydrologic event usually will then drive them um, to nearby waterways. Um, and just in general, um, seed treatments are increasing overall. Um, when I first started this work, it was mostly uh, corn and soy um, that were that were being treated, but um, now, you know, wheat, rice, barley, peas, um, a whole, you know, all sorts of, um, you know, any seeds planted um, are getting treated. And as I said, it's not usually just a neonicotinoid, it's usually a neonicotinoid and then one to five fungicides, um, which kind of comes to my next point. Um, you know, these were just one class of compounds that we're measuring in a waterway. Um, there's not only just other, you know, pesticides such as herbicides, fungicides that could also um, be on these seed coatings, um, but there's just other contaminants. Um, we all know that there's a complex mi mixture, especially in our waterways, pharmaceuticals, metals, or even things like microplastics um, could be confounding factors and contributing to this sort of, you know, potential effects um, in these aquatic ecosystems. So that's always something to keep in Keep in mind and keep in context, um, you know, it's hard to talk about all potential pesticides in one talk and, you know, the neonics are really increasing um, and their use really is, so that's why I focused on them, but it's always good to take a step back and realize there's this, this whole mixture of everything. Um, so with that, before I take questions, I would really like to thank, um, I had so many co-authors and so many collaborators on the studies I presented. Um, but I really always like to give a huge thank you to the people that actually work in California. Um, with me in my lab, um, they're awesome and, uh, you know, they're really key in making sure these samples get processed and analyzed in a timely fashion. Um, we've really sh tried to strive um, to get quick turnaround time so that if we need to go somewhere and take another sample, we can. Uh, we are a research lab. Um, that's our goal. You know, that's sort of one of our charges and, you know, we don't do um, as many samples as a lot of labs do, but we really try to, to focus in on things. But um, I am lucky to have a, a fantastic group um, of people that are really trying um, just to, like, make sure we have good data and uh, to um, ensure that, you know, we're doing what we can um, with the neonicotinoids and a bunch of other um, studies we're looking at. So with that, I'd be happy to take questions.